for the topic that we're going to be covering this morning. As you can see, it's going to be a review of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Um, it'll, this will be the passage that kind of serves as the springboard for our thoughts this morning, but want to read this passage as an introduction. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. There the Bible reads, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so we're going to be exploring this passage this morning, exactly what does it mean to judge someone? What does it mean to, uh, you know, what, what is, what is uh, Jesus referring to in this passage? What type of judgment? Um, are there times when we should judge someone? Uh, we'll be exploring all these questions. This is perhaps one of the most quoted passages in all the Bible. Um, Bruce Robart, even in a uh, sermon I heard him give on this topic, uh, he said that uh, he read it, he came across an article that said that this passage actually had surpassed John 3:16 a few years ago as far as being the, kind of the most referenced or most quoted passage. So uh, you know, it's certainly one we want to give time to and explore this morning. Uh, but before we do uh, go any further, let's first go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. I want to uh, start off my message this morning talking about a few sources that I used to uh, put this together. Uh, this was a sermon I had to uh, go back and look to see when it was I put it together. It was back in 2019. Uh, and these were some of the sources that I used at that time and kind of uh, revised it a little bit um, and uh, it, here recently. And just so looking at these sources... Brother Aaron Batty actually back in 2014 wrote an article uh, entitled Don't Judge Me in the Christian Informer. That was a very helpful source. Uh, Brother Mike Criswell, of course, his commentary on Matthew. Uh, then we've got a couple of sermons. Bruce Roebuck, uh, where he talks about Judge Not. Uh, that was very helpful. Encourage anybody. You can go to ChristianLandmark.com or go to YouTube and just type in Bruce Roebuck, Judge Not, and you can find that sermon. It's uh, under 30 minutes. Uh, and then Brandon Stevens as well, somewhere around 30 minutes, where he talks about what is a liberty, and we'll be referencing that a little bit later uh, in, the, uh, in the message this morning. So very helpful sources there. Uh, going back, I want to read this passage again to uh, help introduce our thoughts again. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So as we reflect upon this, as I mentioned in the introduction, it's one of the most quoted passages in the Bible, but it's also perhaps one of the most misunderstood passages. You know, a lot of times people will kind of use this as their trump card, so to speak. You know, if somebody's drawing attention to something they're doing or if they're pointing out a fault or a mistake that they're making, you know, they, they reference back, judge not that you be not judged. You know, you shouldn't judge me uh, because you're not perfect either. Uh, and uh, that's a... Uh, you know, not completely an appropriate way to uh, use that passage, so we'll be exploring it uh, in depth this morning. Uh, the word judge can also be translated condemn, and so uh, condemn not that you be not condemned. And so is Jesus saying in this passage that it's wrong to judge? That's kind of a question that we hope to answer this morning. Keep it in the back of your mind. Is he saying that it's wrong under all circumstances to ever judge another person? So we'll be answering that. First, we want to give a couple of definitions to the word judge. We've also noticed that it means condemn, but the word judge also means to form an authoritative opinion. To form an authoritative opinion about a person, about a situation. Also, Webster's definition, to form an opinion about through careful weighing of evidence and testing of premises. A careful weighing of evidence and testing of premises. You know, sometimes when we... Uh, judge others or others judge us. I don't know that there's a whole lot of weighing of the evidence. Sometimes it's just a very quick uh, judgment call that they make. Uh, but those are a couple of definitions there. It's important too to notice the kind of the origins and scriptures of the judge. Exodus chapter 18, we read a uh, passage about Moses uh, and, and the example of him being judge over the people. Here in Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 16, and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. 
So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So here we see uh, you know, one of the first views that we have of a judge in Scripture. Uh, Moses' father-in-law is coming before him saying, you know, who are you to judge this people? You know, who, are they, who are you that they're, you're sitting alone by yourself and they're coming to you uh, to ask your opinion on these things or to bring their matters before you? But of course, Moses is speaking uh, as an orator of God uh, from the mouth of God, and he's helping these people to uh, decipher their situation. So he's, being, he's serving as a judge over the people. So that's where kind of uh, we see some origins of judgment. Some other passages we can reference as far as judgments taking place in Scripture. Uh, we see Noah rebukes Ham for the sin he committed in Genesis chapter 9. God rebukes Sarah in Genesis 18 for doubting. Samuel rebukes Saul for unauthorized sacrifice. Nathan makes David aware of his adultery. We recall that story very well when uh, Nathan uses the illustration and then uh, points out that he's the, uh, he's the uh, one guilty of sin. Uh, we see Solomon demonstrates wise judgment. 1 Kings chapter 3, that's a passage we all might recognize where uh, there's a uh, baby brought before Solomon. Two, two uh, ladies are saying, this is my child. And Moses decides between the two. He, he exercises wise judgment in order to determine uh, whose baby uh, it belongs to. Uh, we see that Jesus rebukes Peter for being carnally minded in Mark 8. And then Paul rebukes the church at Corinth for taking brethren to court in 1 Corinthians 6. That's just a few passages we could look at of various judgments and uh, condemnations taking place in the Scripture. Another one we'd see is in John chapter 7, verse 24. There the Bible says, Do not judge according to appearance, but with righteous judgment. But judge with righteous judgment. We'll be referencing this passage a little bit later in the study. So going back to our question, is it wrong? Is Jesus saying it's wrong to judge? Is He saying it's wrong to judge other people? The answer is no. He's not saying in this passage that it's ever wrong to judge someone. He's saying judge not that you be not judged. He's, he, but in saying that, He's not saying that it's wrong to ever judge someone. And we'll be exploring exactly uh, under what circumstances it is okay to judge. But it's important for us to answer this question right off. Uh, because there are situations when we should make a judgment call. So what exactly is He condemning? If it is okay for us to judge under certain circumstances, what exactly is Jesus condemning in Matthew chapter 7? Well, going back to the passage, we see here that He says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how do you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Here's what here's Jesus is using an analogy. He's talking about a speck of sawdust or a piece of dust in somebody's eye that uh, somebody is trying to take out of their brother's eye. Meanwhile, that person who's trying to do the correction has a plank or a square timber or a two by four sticking out of their own eye. And so he's, he's making an analogy here that one sin is small, but still significant. All sin is sin. But then he makes the other uh, obvious and to a greater degree. And so he's drawing a comparison. Uh, he's making this analogy between these two and saying you've got one small insignificant sin and the other is obvious and to a greater degree. Uh, I like Mike Criswell's comment here. He says it's like a blind ophthalmologist who imagines he is qualified to perform surgery on a patient with cataracts. You know, that's... Uh, Something quite humorous, but as we reflect upon that, that's essentially what Jesus is drawing attention to. Uh, he's saying that you've got somebody who's trying to exercise judgment on somebody when they're in no position themselves to make a judgment call because they're guilty of maybe perhaps that same sin or a different sin, but to a greater degree. Uh, and so they're in no position to judge another person. In verse 5, he says, Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So in this verse, we see exactly what Jesus is condemning. When we're trying to figure out, pinpoint, what is Jesus condemning? What type of judgment? He's talking about hypocritical judgment. 
judgment where the individual is guilty of the same exact sin or a sin to a, what we would consider a worse degree uh, than the person they're trying to judge. He's condemning hypocritical judgment. You know, we cannot properly help to remove the sin from our brother's uh, life until we take care of the sin in our own life. You know, we, we, are, uh, we put ourselves at a disadvantage or we disqualify ourselves when we are guilty of our own sin we then can't have the impact that we need to have in one another's lives um, because of what we uh, fail to remove from our own life. Brother Criswell also says, Jesus is not saying that our lives must be perfectly pure before we can convict others of sin. Rather, we must first sincerely and humbly recognize and attempt to correct our own shortcomings before we propose to cure the same in our brother. So he's not saying it's, it's, it's wrong for us to correct them. It's, and also he's not saying that we've got to be fully perfect before we can then be a proper judge over somebody else. But we have to be making great strides of improvement in our own life before we try to be of benefit and of help to others. That should be our goal is to be a blessing and a help to those that are struggling. Uh, we've got a few examples that I want to look at that help to kind of illustrate this point that Jesus is making further uh, we see an example of Moses being judged by others in Exodus chapter 2. There the Bible reads, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked at this way and that way, and when no one saw him, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. You know, this is a common uh, passage for us to reference back to, but I think it, uh, it, nails the, uh, it, it hits the nail on the head as we reflect upon uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7 and what Jesus is saying. Here you've got the example of Moses who uh, goes out, does what he considers to be a a good act at, at protecting his Hebrew brother by killing an Egyptian. Um, and then the next day he goes out, the very next day he goes out and finds two Hebrew men fighting, um, you know, having a, having a scuffle, and uh, he's, telling, he's trying to correct them and trying to break up the fight. And they're saying, well, who are you to come correct us? Because we know you just killed an Egyptian yesterday. So who are you to come before us and judge us? Uh, and so that's exactly what Jesus is pointing out in Matthew chapter 7. You're, you're in no position to judge somebody else if you yourself have not corrected uh, your own sin uh, or if you're guilty of sin. We also see uh, in John chapter 8, another commonly uh, referenced passage, John 8 verses 3 through 7, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And of course we know how the story ends. One by one they begin to drop the stones that they were holding, preparing to stone the woman, and they depart and Jesus is left alone with the woman. No one else stands to accuse them. Uh, accuse her. And so in this passage, it's, it's obvious what uh, the reference that we're trying to make here is that you've got individuals who bring this woman before Jesus. They're trying to judge her. They're trying to bring, um, bring the punishment upon her, do her, uh, what they feel from the law of Moses. But Jesus turns it around on them and he says, well, wait a minute. Y'all, let him who hath no sin cast the first stone. In other words, I know that y'all are guilty probably of the same exact sin. Uh, and you have to wonder also where the, uh, the man was, you know, if they brought the woman before him who was caught in adultery, then there had to have been a man caught in adultery as well. Uh, why didn't they bring him before him? Uh, but that's a side conversation. But here we see that these individuals are condemned by Jesus uh, because they are guilty of sin themselves. And one by one, uh, they depart because there's nothing that they can say against, <clears throat> excuse me, against the woman. So here we see another example of hypocritical judgment. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, there it says, Jesus, or excuse me, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans, and of course writing to uh, Jews here, he says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, 
for you who practice, you who judge practice the same things, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? And so here we see that uh, Jesus is just, or excuse me, Paul is further illustrating this point uh, that we uh, need to be mindful of not being guilty of hypocritical judgment. I mentioned he was talking to Jews here. This was this upcoming passage is the one I was uh, wanting to reference as far as that goes. <clears throat> Romans chapter two, verses seventeen through twenty-four. There it says, "Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know His will, and approve the things that are excellent." being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. And so here we see another example of hypocritical judgment. And uh, I love the way that he closes this out because he's saying the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And it, it's something that we all should reflect upon as we go about our day-to-day -day lives and we interact with people of the world. Is the name of God blasphemed because of the way that I'm conducting myself, uh, by the way I talk, by the way I act? Uh, by the things that I take part in is the name of God blasphemed among those that I come into contact with. It's something that we need to be mindful of. Another thing that Chriswell states about this passage is we become hypocrites when we attempt to cure another of the same disease we refuse to cure in ourselves. And also something that we need to be mindful of is if we are actively involved in a sin, not only do we put ourselves at a guilty distance from God, but as I mentioned previously, we disqualify ourselves from being able to judge and rebuke a brother or sister who is also involved in a sin or perhaps that same sin. So we disqualify ourselves from being able to be a, of benefit to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So hypocritical living means, number one, we are endangering our own souls. We're guilty of sin. We need to recognize that, repent of it. But also we disqualify ourselves to judge and help another erring member. That should be one of the take-home passage or take-home thoughts from Matthew chapter 7 is to recognize that he's not saying don't judge because you're guilty of sin. He says you need to make sure you correct yourself so that you can then be a proper judge and a, uh, a helper in the life of your brother or sister. And then the third point is we damage our own credibility and influence. I think that speaks for itself. The fact that uh, you know our sins eventually will find us out, and people will, uh, you know, no matter what we say, they're going to say the proof's in the pudding. How are we actually living our lives? Are we walking the walk and uh, talking the talk? Uh, number four, we damage our reputation and the influence of the church, as we've already noticed. So there's some very damaging things that can happen with hip hypocritical living uh, that we all need to be mindful of. Romans 2 and 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as we've already noticed. And so what is the solution? He gives us that solution uh, in Matthew chapter 7. Number one, we are commanded to correct our own lives first. We need to take personal inventory of our lives and make sure that we are where we find fault as we compare it with God's word, that we're correcting that behavior. And then the second part of that solution is that we have a command and an obligation to correct and help restore our fellow Christian. And so the question that I asked uh, toward the beginning of the sermon is, are there times when we should judge? Is it, is it wrong to judge? And are there times when we should be judging others? The answer is yes, there are times. And uh, it's, it's in, an or, in order for us to restore our fellow uh, members of Christ. And so what exactly, what types of judgment does the Bible condemn? Well, number one, as we've already mentioned, hypocritical judgment. Number two, it condemns judging liberties. And this can be a whole other sermon by itself. And I encourage everybody to go, uh, go on YouTube and listen to Brother Brandon Stevens' sermon on uh, uh, Christian liberties. Type in Brandon Stevens' Christian liberties. He gave a uh, sermon about three years ago. On, uh, he's given it uh, a few different times, but three years ago is the one I saw most recently at Blue Springs, Kentucky. But very good sermon uh, and very good content on this topic. And it's a very important topic as well. I can't stress that enough as we 
think about uh, this, this topic of Christian liberties. And so, as far as uh, judging liberties, you know, when we think about Bible teaching, all Bible teaching falls into essentially three buckets. We've got things that are required, things that are prohibited, and then in the middle, you've got things that are permitted, things that are neither uh, wrong to commit nor wrong to leave out. Um, and so in that middle category are liberties. Now, what we have to be careful of is that we don't uh, associate things in the category of Christian liberties that aren't truly a liberty. Sometimes people try to lump things in with, with uh, Christian liberties. It's my liberty to do this or that. Uh, really, we need to take a close look at Scripture and recognize that you may feel like it's a liberty, but it actually could be something that's required or it could be something that's prohibited. So we need to make sure that we're keeping track of these three buckets. Uh, but as we reflect upon liberties, um, they can be either explicit or implicit. All these things can be explicit or implicit, but explicit means it clearly lays it out, it clearly labels it, it lets you know with beyond the shadow of a doubt what it's talking about. Implicit means that um, it's implied by the context of the passage, we can imply what the writer is talking about. So all these things are made known to us either explicitly or implicitly. Uh, and as far as Christian liberties, the same is true for them. Uh, and so they're, they're either explicit or implicit, and that means that a Christian cannot just label any given action as a liberty in order to just suit themselves. And so a liberty is an action which is neither wrong to commit or wrong to omit. So that's kind of a, just a simple definition for all of us. A Christian liberty is something that's neither wrong to commit nor wrong to leave out or to, to overlook or to omit in our lives. And so liberties are mentioned in Scripture, as I mentioned, explicitly or implicitly. Uh, here's an example of an explicit liberty. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so here the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he's letting them know that it, it is a liberty if they choose to get married or not. It's not a requirement. Uh, they're not in, not in sin if they choose not to get married. They're not in sin if they decide to get married. It's a liberty. And it's one that is explicitly stated. One that is implicitly stated in 1 Timothy 4 and 8, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And so this is kind of a, uh, I guess an unusual one to include, but uh, that first phrase there, for bodily exercise profits a little. Here, Paul's talking to Timothy and he's saying, hey, you can get a little bit of benefit from physical exercise, but it's obviously physical exercise is not a requirement of all Christians. He's just saying it's a liberty. You can, you can uh, uh, do physical exercise uh, and you might benefit from it. And then he goes on to make the ultimate point that he was wanting to make for that passage. But that's just an example of a liberty that's implied from the passage. And so in Romans 14, verses 1 and 3, there the Bible says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. And so here we see in Romans 14, we've got individuals who uh, are exercising their liberties on eating, eating things in a passage that we'll look at uh, here in a moment talks about uh, meat that's offered to idols. What you have here is uh, um, individuals who are eating meat that's been offered to idols and it's been sold into the marketplace. There's some Christians who had the perspective that that's wrong, we shouldn't be doing that, it violated their conscience to do that. But those that were strong in the faith recognized that, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, you know, these idols, these, these gods they're worshiping to don't even exist. Uh, it's okay for us to eat this meat because essentially what they've done is, is, is absolutely nothing. They've just simply you know, transferred it from one place to the other, said a few words over it, brought it to the meat market, and now they're selling it. So there's nothing wrong with it. And so uh, um, you know, we, what we see here is that uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 25, eat, uh, he, he commands them, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. And so here we've got some individuals who have a weak conscience. Uh, don't use the word weak to speak uh, badly of them. Don't think of it in a negative context. But it was just people who had a conscience that had not fully developed to what some of these strong Christians had. Um, these strong Christians recognized it was okay to eat this meat offered to idols. 
uh, because it essentially meant nothing. Uh, but these weak Christians had a problem with it. They just couldn't get around that idea that, hey, it's been used in pagan worship. And uh, so they just really wrestled with that. Well, Paul's telling them both parties, you shouldn't be judging the other. Those that are weak, you shouldn't be judging those that decide to eat the meat. And those that decide to eat the meat, you shouldn't be placing judgment on those that, that are of a weaker conscience. You shouldn't be looking down upon them. This is a Christian liberty. And that's how we all should respond as we reflect upon Christian liberties as well. We shouldn't be judging one another if things are truly a liberty. Um, we shouldn't condemn those who practice it and we shouldn't condemn those who decide not to do it. And so that's another type of judgment that takes place. Uh, Romans 14 and 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And so does this verse say that it's wrong to judge? Essentially what Paul is saying that we should not judge one another regarding a Christian liberty. So it's, it's not wrong for us to judge always, but as it pertains to Christian liberties, that is something we are to abstain from. And so again, if you're kind of questioning, if you've got you know, in your mind, you know, what exactly falls into this category of Christian liberties uh, again, I'm, as I mentioned, it's a sermon for another time, but I would highly encourage you to go listen to Brandon Stevens' message on that. Uh, you'll find it very valuable uh, as we reflect upon this topic. But, you know, how do we view these liberties? Um, you know, as we think about some of these things, you know, it's, it's a liberty, so I'm free to do it. You know, if we think that something falls into this category, it's my own Christian liberty, therefore I should get to do it if I want to, no matter what somebody says about it. Or do we have the mindset, it's a liberty, so I can do without it. If I know I'm offending somebody's conscience by doing this, then I can do without it because I don't want to cause my brother or sister to stumble. If it, if it impacts their conscience, they're seeing me do it, maybe it encourages them to want to do it, um, that, then I've caused them to go against their conscience and for them that is sin. Another question we need to ask ourselves is, will it cause a fellow Christian to fall? We've already noticed that. 1 Corinthians 10 and 29 Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Uh, and I love what Brother Brandon Stevens mentions on this. Something is a sin when we are not absolutely certain that it's right. And I'll say that again just for emphasis. Something is a sin when we are not absolutely certain that it's right. So we got to be careful about what we put in that category of Christian liberties because it may not really be a liberty. And also, a liberty must be lawful. Uh, but not only that, it must be unquestionably lawful. It must be undisputably lawful or according to God's Word, uh, scriptural, in order for us to then call it a liberty. A couple other questions. Can I glorify God through this action? And also, is this going to help my light shine to those around me? So those are things we need to be recognizing about Christian liberties. So there's two instances we've looked at so far. Judgment. Uh, how it, what it's condemned in the Bible, hypocritical judgment, and also judging liberties. The third category and final category we're going to look at is judging the heart. And so what does this mean? To judge, this means to judge someone's motives or what they're thinking, to judge their mindset. If we see them performing you know, a, a, a certain act or you know, if, we, if we catch them doing what we just at first glance think is, is wrong or hearing them say something, you know, have, we, have we judged their motives? Um, and that's something we certainly can't do. We can't know uh, the mind of another person. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11, For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. You know, we can't help uh, or we can't possibly judge the mind of another person or the heart of another person. Uh, John 7 and 24 says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We notice this previously in the study, but uh, we've got a quote here from Will Rogers. I never met a man I didn't like. You know, when we think about the, uh, the idea of not judging a book by its cover, how often are we guilty of that? You know, judging someone based upon first glance before really getting to know them. And so we should give everyone an honest uh, first chance and avoid any preconceived notions. And that's kind of essentially what it means to judge someone based upon their heart, judge someone based upon their appearance, uh, judge someone based upon just our, our first glance, uh, what we think about this person. But as this, as this passage points out, John 7 and 24, 
to judge with righteous judgment. What exactly does that mean? And we'll explore that now. Well, to judge with righteous judgment and the, the judgments that are commanded, we've looked at those that are uh, forbidden against, those that are prohibited in the Bible. Um, we shouldn't be guilty of hypocritical judgment, judging liberties and judging people's heart. But things that we are to do are to judge ourselves first and foremost. Matthew 7 and 5, as we've already mentioned, hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We need to be looking, taking a close inventory of our own lives and judging ourselves. That judgment uh, is confirmed in the Bible, and we certainly should be doing that. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 31 and 32, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. You know, that's one way that we can save ourselves from being judged by others is to make sure that we're first judging ourselves, that we're uh, putting our life through the filter of God's Word and making sure that we're in conformity with it. And by that, we're going to be able to prevent ourselves from being judged by other people. Secondly, we're to judge others. You know, and you might be thinking, well, our opening passage said we're not supposed to be judging others. Uh, how come you're saying this is something that we, that we should be partaking in? Uh, and so we, we have a few passages to help explain that. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 through 5, there it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So in this passage, we see that the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he's telling them, he's calling this, uh, calling this sinful act out and he's saying that he's already judged individuals who've been guilty of this sin. And Paul commands them to uh, put those individuals away. So basically, this can serve as a blueprint for them of how you need to handle these types of situations. A judgment call has to be made. And you have to make sure that you're taking care of the sin that's within a congregation uh, and making sure that, that we're uh, dealing with that. We shouldn't let it go unchecked. And so we are commanded to judge others. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6 uh, this immediately follows our opening passage. We read the first five verses of Matthew 7. Here in verse 6 we see, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. And so here we see as we, as we teach others, we need to judge. You know, you're bringing, as we bring the Word of God to individuals and we see that they trample it underfoot or they completely disregard it, you know, we're to kind of wipe the dust off of our feet and move on to more uh, profitable uh, arenas and, and to move on to uh, more promising prospects of presenting uh, the gospel. And so a judgment call has to be made there as well. You know, have we done our due diligence at presenting the Word of God? Um, and, uh, you know, should we move on? We have to be patient with individuals, yet we've got to be wise uh, as we strive to teach them. And as Chris Well points out, if a sinner continually refuses the gospel, we must turn to more suitable prospects. Another passage, 2 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22, for it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. There are some people who are not going to respect the word of God no matter how it's presented, no matter how many times it's presented. And it's then that we have to make a judgment call about is this individual going to receive this information or should I move on? So that's another example of when we're judging others. Another thing that we do when we're judging others and confronting others about the sin that they're involved with, after we've taken care of our own sin and made sure that we're in a position to be able to then properly judge and help correct others, we've got to do that in the proper manner. We've got to make sure we go about it in the right mindset. Uh, number one, we've got to carefully consider the situation. You know, have we got all of the information? Have we got all the facts you know, before we're confronting this individual? Maybe, maybe we heard something wrong and maybe we need to go back and just double check 
uh, to make sure we've got our facts right before we approach that person. And then most importantly, we've got to know what God's Word says about that particular situation before we confront them. We've got to, we've, we've got to know our Scripture in order to uh, defend them and to be able to properly correct the other individual. Another thing is we've got to have the right mindset. And I can't stress this part enough or, or the next point. Uh, we got to do it for the welfare of the individual and for others. You know, when we're correcting somebody, is our mindset to prove somebody wrong? You know, is it just strictly out of, you know, we just want to, you know, take a targeted approach and just immediately uh, let them have it, so to speak, come in guns a-blazing? Um, or is our mindset to do it for the purpose of making sure that we're letting them know what their wrong is, but doing it in a way that we're helping to uh, have the ultimate goal of restoring them to God. That should be our ultimate goal. We shouldn't be uh, in this uh, just solely this condemnation mindset. We need to make sure that we're doing it and having the right reasons in our mind. We're doing it for the welfare, uh, the spiritual well-being of this person or these individuals involved. The third thing that we're supposed to do is we're to judge the words that are spoken. Uh, a few passages we can look at for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. That goes for me speaking this morning. You know, whenever somebody gets up to uh, preach in this pulpit, you need to make sure that we're judging the words that they're speaking, not just taking their word for it, but again, using that righteous judgment of what does the Word of God say? What saith the Scriptures? And we always need to be judging those things. Job 34, verses 3 and 4. For the year tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. You know, another passage we can think about is Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where we see the faithful Bereans who search the Scriptures daily to determine if the things they were hearing uh, were truly the case. We need to know our Bible and make sure that we're judging what we're hearing. Uh, even if it's in our, our everyday life, we're having a conversation with someone. You know, we don't want to be easily persuaded uh, to uh, false doctrine. Uh, and so we need to be carefully judging and monitoring the words that we're hearing. John 5 and 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So if you're wondering, uh, we've already mentioned it a little bit, but uh, if you're wondering what uh, is referred to in John 7 and 24, where he talks about using righteous judgment, this is it. Uh, it's doing the will of God. When we take our life and the life of another or the life of another and compare it to God's Word, what does it say? That is when we're using righteous judgment. And so to kind of draw these, these things uh, in, into a summary here, we've got unrighteous judgment and righteous judgment. The unrighteous judgment that we've looked at this morning is hypocritical judgment. We've looked at judging people based upon Christian liberties. And again, I continue, or I stress to you to go and, and study that topic further. Maybe it'll be another topic we can present at another time because it's very important for us to fully recognize what that topic is because I feel like a lot of people are steered away on that topic of liberties. And they use that almost as a, uh, as a crutch to say, well, this is my liberty and when it's really not a liberty. A third thing that we do is judging others based upon their heart or what we think their mindset is. And then we've noticed some righteous judgment, Think, things that we as Christians need to make sure that we're doing uh, and what we've been commanded to do. Number one, we've got to judge ourselves. We've stressed that point a lot, uh, but it can't be said enough because we've got to make sure that we're in a position to judge others, step number two. Um, and I, I gave this sermon at another place and um, uh, a brother got up in the uh, closing announcements and said, you know, appreciate the message this morning. Uh, you know, what, one thing we need to recognize is none of us are perfect, and uh, so we're, we're not in a position to judge other people. Don't let that be the takeaway of this message. I didn't, I didn't drive it home well enough, I guess, uh, in uh, the, the day that I gave that. But what I want us to recognize is we are absolutely responsible for judging one another. If I'm in error, I want you to let me know so that I can correct that behavior. And if you're in error, we need to have that relationship to where I can come to you in an effort to help you. It shouldn't be in a uh, holier-than-thou mindset, uh, but we should absolutely be judging one another uh, and doing it in the proper way as we've noticed. And I can't stress that enough that Matthew chapter 7 is not saying to never judge anyone. It's saying you need to judge others, but you got to take care of yourself first before you can do that. So I want to make sure that point's clear this morning. If you don't get anything else from the lesson, I hope it's that. And then thirdly, and importantly, to make sure that we're judging the words that we hear 
and the words we hear um, others speak, whether from the pulpit or in our day-to-day -day lives. Well, we can't talk about the, uh, this topic of judgment without thinking about the final judgment as we draw our lesson to a close and as we segue into uh, the invitation here in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You know, when, I, when we talked about righteous judgment, it's taking the Word of God, opening it up, and making sure that we're making righteous judgment based upon what He's told us in His Word. And to recognize that's what we're all going to be judged on in the last day. The Scriptures are going to be opened, and we're going to be judged based upon the instruction of God's Word. And so, if, you're, if you stand at a guilty distance from God this morning, I encourage you as we're about to sing this invitation song to make those wrongs right. There's no one here that that uh, condemns you. It's the Word of God that is the correction, uh, the correcting factor in your life. But we certainly want to do whatever we can to help you make things right. And if you're not a Christian, we want you to make that right today. And come take those steps as we read about uh, first to hear uh, the Word of God in Romans 10 and 17 uh, to believe. Uh, as we read about in John 3.16, believe that Jesus uh, is the Son of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God to repent of our sins, Luke 13 and 3, to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10 and 9, and then to be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and 38. If you're subject to the Gospel call, please come while we stand and sing. If you want to see more sermons like the one you just watched, then click on the subscribe button below and you'll be alerted when a new video is uploaded. Also, check out our website at chapelgrovechurch.com. At the top of the page, you'll find a resources button where you can take a free online Bible study series. One series is Are You Saved? It's a completely video series conducted by myself, Aaron Batty. The other one is written. It's called the Truth Free Series. Upon completion of either one, you'll get a copy of a free book in the mail, Muscle and a Shovel. Thanks for watching our channel. We'll see you next time.